My name is Ray Aldred, and uh, I'm from, uh, originally from northern Alberta. My mother was born on the banks of the Lesser Slave Lake, which is about four hours' drive north of Edmonton. My mom was born in a tent on the banks of the Lesser Slave Lake in 1937, and it was March. It was probably cold. And she lived in a tent the first six years of her life. She used to tell me it was a nice tent, though. That is a joke, by the way. <laughs> I met my wife. I went my wife when I was 14. We didn't get married when I was 14 because I was scared to death when I met her because I, I knew that that was the woman that I would marry. And so I did what most men do. The first time they feel love, they run away. So that's what I did. And uh, we were married. We've been married 43 years now. We have four adult children. My two daughters live close to where I live in Richmond, British Columbia now. I have a son who lives in Montreal. He's doing a PhD in philosophy at McGill University, and he's married. And then I have a son who's married and lives in northern Alberta and works in the oil industry. I want to talk today about spirituality and humility. Spirituality was a popular term in the late 90s. I don't know if it's still popular, but in the late 90s it was popular. I think today, community, people talk a lot about community. But in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was a lot of writing about spirituality. Eugene Peterson writes, we always write and talk about the things that we don't have. And I think that people write about spirituality because they didn't have any. And I think people write about community because they don't know what it is. So that's the challenge. I was blessed. I was blessed to be able to work among indigenous people, my people. I began ministry, full-time ministry in Regina, Saskatchewan. And there I was taught by indigenous people Canada, spirituality was, indigenous spirituality was the object of attack by Christian kingdoms that came to North America. And those attacks intensified in the late 1800s in Canada. Canada was nervous about things other than re Christian religions, so they used to attack those kinds of things in different ways. We were in the period in those days of Christendom the idea that you could create a Christian kingdom that would have dominion from sea to sea, that was the idea. This was a dream of Canada. And to this day, most churches in Canada still have a Christendom hangover. I think there's still hope that somehow things will turn around and somehow everything will go back to the way it was before. Sometimes churches focus on building up their their own sort of thing with little regard for the indigenous church or the church of the suffering. We shifted our thinking, however. Our modern society shifted its thinking. Modern society did not want to be Christian, so it invented religion. There's no word in our indigenous, in Cree for religion. Religion is a word that was invented by the Western world, probably in Europe in the late 1600s or early 1600s. They invented the word re religion to talk about spirituality without actually having any. That's what religion works. That's how that word works. Religion was invented by the Western world as a way to be in control, to try to avoid conflict, to avoid the mistakes of the past, so the church invents the idea of secular and religious. Even now, religion is considered something private. It occupies the inner world of values, but does not fit within the public world of scientific facts or of public discourse. In fact, Leslie Newbigin wrote that in the West, or really in the Western North Atlantic nations, we evaluate the gospel with a scientific worldview and cannot switch to have the gospel evaluate our scientific worldview. 
unless we hear the gospel told back to us from another cultural perspective. Our modern Christian church has reduced spirituality to folk religion, and folk religion is used to maintain the status quo. Anyways, I say these things because I come from a people who see spiritual all around them. I remember one time I, was, I had a teepee, which I don't think a lot of people in Toronto probably have a teepee, but I had one. I used to carry it around on my station wagon, and I would volunteer to take it to high schools and set it up and tell stories. So I was doing this on one occasion. I met with the I met with the, the, the principal, the vice principal, and I said, well, I understand that I, because I'm a minister of the gospel and I believe in Jesus, that I can't talk about that when I'm talking at your public school. And she said, oh, no, that's your spirituality. You just go ahead. So I set up a teepee at a public high school and talked about Jesus because I was indigenous and I'm allowed to do that. See, for us, spirituality is about life. How can you not be spiritual and live life? It takes in everything around us. Spirituality or the power, it's, it's, it's paying attention that any time the Creator could do something powerful and trying to pay attention to understand what that is and what that means. When someone has power or spirituality, they, we, sometimes they use the word gitse. Gitse, it's powerful. So then they use that for the gitsman too, which is sometimes used for the great mystery, the creator. A person's words must match up with the way that they live. That's how you know if someone is truly spiritual. We've had many people come to our communities and say they had some kind of spirituality. And that could be true, but what the people do is they watch to see if their lives actually bear that out. Otherwise, it's just talk. And one of the things you watch for is humility, or should I say that humility is the place where you often encounter the spiritual. And it's often in our stories that we see the small, the weak, the old, the young. It is those where we, it is those who who actually God speaks through. A powerful working of the Creator in our midst, and that's spirituality. That's spirituality. With this, with this in mind, we need to consider these passages. When I, was, when I wrote this, I was thinking about what the elders taught me about spirituality and living a truly spiritual life, a humble life, recognizes that our vision is limited and that we are always in need of relationship, for this is what it is to be human, a spiritual creature, a human being who is small and the most dependent of all the creatures in all of creation. So the gospel for this week focused upon religious leaders who looked down upon others and missed the, and missed the whole understanding about what spirituality truly is. One of the lessons that the elders worked hard to help me understand and to shift my thinking was around the difference between saying I know and saying I understand. I mean, I was studying, I was studying theology. I did an undergrad in theology. I did a master of divinity and I did a doctor. I got a doctor of theology from Wycliffe College here in Toronto. And I was studying the science of God, Thomas Aquinas called it. And in my studies, my studies were all about knowing things. You take exams to show what you know. When you're ordained, they ask you all kinds of questions about whether or not you can answer them depends on whether your ordination will be sustained or confirmed. And it's all about what you know. So the elders would talk to me, and they always talked in stories, and it troubled me because I couldn't understand. I didn't un and so then they would say, well, this is, I'm trying to tell you something. And then I would say, I know, I know. And they would say, don't say I know. Say I understand, I understand. Because when you say I know, when you say I know, you're talking like knowledge comes from you.
halfway through mastering divinity, which is just arrogant if you think about it, halfway through earning my Master of Divinity degree, so halfway through mastering divinity, I realized that I was missing the heart. I began to try to see the world through the eyes of my indigenous relatives. The thing about the Cree people is that they often just wait and be patient for someone who is brash and talks too much and doesn't listen. Because when you're young, you want to tell people what you know. And knowledge is power, or so it seems. Finally, one of my elders, as I said, he would say, don't say I know, say I understand. When you say I know, you sound so arrogant, like knowledge began with you. Better, better to say I understand. You see, understanding or wisdom, they said, is like a river, and it flows from the presence of the Creator. And you have just stepped into this river of understanding. Don't say I know. Say I understand. So Jesus is trying to teach his disciples. And the church is trying to teach us something this morning. And I hope that Christ is trying to teach us something through the church, through these passages. And Jesus is trying to teach us as about prayer. The gospel last week was about justice and not to lose hope. And in this passage, not to look down on others with contempt and regard yourselves as righteous. Don't say, I know. Say, I understand. I understand. Jesus is trying to teach some people who are very good at religious stuff. The problem with knowing you are righteous is that you then look down upon others with contempt. That's sort of like the way we are in society right now. We're highly polarized. And each pole looks down upon the other with contempt because they just don't know all that we know. Sometimes think maybe we miss something in doing that. I heard the late Rick DeBias, who used to be the CEO of Young Street Mission. We were both in Edmonton speaking on a justice conference. And I remember he said that the problem or the essence of racism or the theology of racism is that it looks down on another people. It looks down on another people. But our minds and hearts are tricky because we read this passage and we think, no, we're not, we're not like the religious person. We're like the, you know, the person who says, have mercy, have mercy on me. But that's tricky and our minds are tricky. For example, many re reacting to fundamentalists and Calvinists, and maybe they're the same at times, who are always quick to point out people's sin, reduce sin to a manageable thing. And our Pharisee in the story has reduced spirituality or religion to a sin management technique. Except sin is never what we think it is. It's usually something worse. I get that from when I was taking counseling, counselors, you know, you're taking counseling, you say, the problem is never the problem. So when someone comes to you for counseling, they say, oh, that my husband's the problem or my, my spouse is the problem. The problem is never the problem. It's usually worse. Sin is not, usually when people point at something and say, that's sin. That's usually not the problem. It's usually something worse. It's usually something worse. So when you read this story, we don't want to be the Pharisee who wants to... He thinks he's righteous and does all those religious things that makes himself feel better. In essence, he has reduced spirituality to being more pious and better behaved. It's folk religion, good for maintaining the status quo, which is the problem with most religion in Canada. It's just folk religion. It's just aimed at maintaining the status quo. So Jesus used the parable to help people see things differently because... He's telling them story, and they're nodding because this is the common way of praying in the Near East. Oh, I thank, in the ancient Near East, oh, I thank you, God, that I'm not like that person over there. That you've, that you've, even I've heard that men would pray, thank you that you did not make me a woman. And so, sometimes we need to hear the gospel from another culture to understand. When my youngest son was in grade 11, as I said, I used to volunteer. I'd say to schools, hey, if you want me to come talk to your class about 
indigenous things, I'll come and talk. So they would invite me about different things. So I, they invited me to come because they were talking about civil rights and social studies. So I came and they were taking up studying the American Civil Rights Movement. And one of the students asked me, they said, how could people do those things to African American people? How could people do those things? They were so terrible. I said, that's a good question. I said, I'll ask you some questions. And they said, okay. So I said to them, these are grade 11 students, I said, when, what are the words that, I said, when, what are the words that pop into your mind when you think about people who have disabilities? And they came up with a set of words. They said, lame. Uh, I think one of the words was sick, infirm, weak, needing help. They had this whole list of words. And then I said to them, we went through their list of each word. I, would, I said, is lame a positive word or a negative word? Well, it's a negative word. I said, is infirm a positive word or a negative word? Well, that's a negative word. Is weak a positive word or a negative word? That's negative. Went through all their words and I think all of them were negative. And I said, would you say that you have a positive attitude about people with disabilities or a negative attitude based on your responses of the words that pop into your mind? And they said, a negative attitude. I said, well, on a Friday night when you go get a big gulp from 7-Eleven and you're going to watch a movie, do you do that with someone you have a positive attitude about or someone you have a negative attitude about? Someone they have a positive attitude. I said, so you're never going to watch a movie with someone who has a disability? And they said, probably not. I said, have you ever parked in a disabled parking spot and, and then thereby used a form of violence against people with disabilities because they would not be able to have that parking spot. You would make them walk farther. Have you ever done that? And they said, yeah, we have. I said, have you ever called them by a derogatory name? One of the names that they used in that school for people who were in the special education was SPEDS. I said, have you ever called people that? And they said, yeah. I said, so you've actually been prejudiced against people with disabilities. I said, do you think that you have anything to offer people with disabilities, and they all said, oh yeah, we can help them carry their books, we could do all kinds of good things for them. I said, but do you think they have anything to offer you? And I'm not sure they could think of any. I said, if you look at another group of people, if you look down on them as having nothing to offer you, and you have everything to offer them, then you're paternalistic at best, and you're racist at worst. And by your own admission, you've already committed acts of violence against people with disability. And I said, and you didn't even know it. And you didn't even know it. In Canada, Canada looked down and looks down upon Indigenous people as a problem to be solved. And most people in most churches think, we have lots to offer those Indigenous people but they rarely think that Indigenous people have anything to offer them. I always think we're making progress. I always think we're making progress. But God does care. God does care. And he wants to see salvation break out, and he wants to see it change the world. That's what the other passages say. I'll give you back the years the locusts took. I will overflow the land with goodness. The Creator wants to do that. And I always think that we're, we're right on the edge. We're right on the edge. I have high hopes. I have high hopes. I know that here you're doing lots of good things. You're not doing lots of good things. And it flows out of a spirituality that understands that I'm caught and I can't always see the things that I need to see. And I need grace to open my eyes. Have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. And I pray 
that his grace would break out in our midst. Amen. Thank you.